Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming one of the greatest character actors of all time and one of the most prolific, Troy Evans. Oh my god, he has just been in so many great movies and TV shows. He has an impressive resume, everything from Rhinestone to Teen Wolf to Near Dark to Halloween 5, The Revenge of Michael Myers, My Blue Heaven, Ace Ventura, Pet Detective, where he's the Dolphins coach, Roger Predactor, and so many other great things. And I'm going to have him on the show today to talk about all that stuff. Also, I'd like to say, rest in peace, all the victims of 9-11. Today is the 19th anniversary of that fateful, fateful day in which our whole world has just gotten crazier ever since. And hopefully humanity will set in and things will be turned around. So let's give a few seconds of silence to all those poor victims. Once again, rest in peace, the poor victims of 9-11. So yeah, here is my interview with Troy Evans. Hello. Hello, Troy. Welcome to the show, sir. How are you today? I'm I'm good, thanks. Yes, this is such actually a, a reasonable temperature in LA today. Yeah, we got overcast weather over here in Redding, uh, California. So. What's your temperature? <sighs> I don't know. I mean, it's it's pretty hot, but it's overcast at the same time because uh, we got fires over in Chico. Yeah. But um, I'm so ready for 2020 to be gone. Yeah. <laughs> Aren't we all? Oh, man. <laughs> Aren't we all? Yeah. It's been a uh, crazy, crazy year, but I think things will turn around at some point. But uh, this is such oh. a this is such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Thanks for having interest in a funky old character actor. <laughs> so, going back in time, did you gravitate toward acting early on in your childhood? Uh, actually, no. Uh, my grandfather mm -hmm. was, uh, among other things, he was a Montana state senator. Mm hmm. And uh, he was also the boxing commissioner of the state of Montana, and a tough little monkey man. But yeah. he uh, was a senator from Butte, which I don't know if you know anything about Butte, Montana, but that's rough territory. Yeah. Anyway, I that led. I was very interested in uh, uh, politics from a very early age, and what I planned. On, I, I had a, a very concrete plan. Uh, and it was connect there was a guy named Don Nutter, mm. who in fact I now realize was a right wing whack job. <laughs> uh, but he uh, was governor of Montana, and he was talked about as potential presidential timber. And then he was killed in a plane crash. So of course that never happened, but that planted seed in my 10 year old brain that a person from Montana could be president he didn't have to come from Massachusetts so my plan was graduate high school go to the University of Montana go to law school get in the state legislature uh, become a state senator become the governor of Montana and then it's actually in Montana being the senator from Montana is a step up because then you're involved in the national government. Right. And there was also a Montana senator, I don't know if you know the name, but Mike Mansfield was actually the majority leader of the Senate for a number of years and very highly respected. Ended up being the uh, U.S. ambassador to Japan for many years. We're very widely respected. And uh, so that was another beacon I had that I... So that was my plan, was I was going to be president of the United States. So in my freshman <laughs> year in college, 
um, I got uh, that's that's 1966 uh, in the spring of 67. I got drafted, and uh, 1968, uh, May of 68, went to Vietnam, mm-hmm. came home. I was in the uh, 25th Infantry Division, and the year I was in Vietnam, the 25th Division uh, lost 4,200 soldiers. Wow! So that's that's more in my unit. That's more people than we've lost in the Mid East since 9/11. And uh, I was totally unaware of it. But when I came home, I was pretty much out of my mind. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I could function, and every, but, uh, but I was whacked out. And instead of going back to college, I opened a bar up in northwest Montana, uh, ironically called the Powder Keg. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was the only rock and roll bar for about a 150-mile radius. And so it attracted all of the young drinkers, yeah, uh, all of the drug dealers, uh, all of the drug addicts, yeah, all of the narcotics officers, and it was a freaking war zone. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, uh, long story short, I ended up I threw, you know. A, probably a few hundred people out there and I wasn't polite about it. And uh, in one case, a guy started a little kerfuffle in there. He grabbed a woman and then her husband objected and he slapped the husband. And I, in the course of removing him from the bar, broke both his legs, uh, dislocated his shoulder, gave him a skull fracture, brain concussion, and just threw him out in the street. Wow. But he, he was an attorney. <laughs> and it turns out when you do that stuff to an attorney, they don't just give you a $100 fine and a lecture. Yeah. What they gave me was 40 years in Montana State Prison. Wow. 40 years. <laughs> and this sort of circles back to what I told you earlier, because I, what I've done is in, between when I got charged and I realized, man, I'm, I'm really screwed here. And I uh, talked to my attorney and I committed myself to the Veterans Hospital down in uh, Sheridan, Wyoming. And uh, uh, to me, it was just it was just a legal maneuver. I was trying to spend 90 days in the uh, alcohol ward. So when I came back, it would show that I was a veteran, I was trying to help myself, and, uh, uh, you know, and, and I'd gone through the 90 days and all of this. And so I came back and I made a deal with the prosec- with the prosecutor. I, I'd plead guilty to the assault and I'd get six years suspended. Mm-hmm. But unbeknownst to me, the judge, W.W. W. Wesley, had run for the state senate in Montana three times. Mm-hmm. And he'd been defeated <laughs> all three times by my grandfather, who has my same name, Troy Evans. Yeah. And, and I'm lucky and think I was getting six years suspended, and he gave me 40 years. And then, and my attorney, I turned to my attorney, I said, what the hell are we going to do? And he, he said, oh, I don't know, Troy, so I'm, I'm moving my... Uh, uh, practice up to Hamilton today. I, I all best of luck to you. And walked out of the courtroom. Oh boy! Putting the shackles on me, and the prosecuting attorney stood up for me. Went to the judge. Judge, there's something, something wrong here. Says we had a plea bargain with this uh, defendant, and uh, he says I don't care. They used a gun in this. He says no, no, Your Honor, there's no gun in this crime. He says well, I don't. And, uh, and the prosecutor is arguing in my favor to get me out of this 40 year sentence. And finally, the judge says, well, what was he supposed to get? And the uh, uh, prosecutor said, said six, six years suspended. He said, okay, bring him back. Uh, they have me almost out of the courtroom now. Yeah. He takes me back and, and says, uh, I'm uh, altering the sentence uh, to the defendant, Troy Evans. Uh, uh, I'm sentencing him to 40 years hard labor, Montana State Prison, plus six years suspended. So now I've got... 46 years. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, so, uh, jumping to 
the end of that story, it took a couple of years, mm-hmm. uh, but that that case went because of the bizarre nature of the sentencing, the sentencing me and then stopping the bailiff and resentencing and giving me it and the prosecutor objecting and all that. It, there was a sentencing review commission in Montana. Mm-hmm. And when they got through it two years later, they kicked me loose. Wow. So, and, and the, of course, and life's full of ironies. The fact is, like, when I, when I went down to the Veterans Hospital, uh, my, when I first uh, suggested that to my attorney, uh, he said, well, Troy, are you an alcoholic? I said, no, I'm not an alcoholic. But the beauty of it is, since I drink like a fifth and a half a day, I think I can make them think I am. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll bet I can fool them right into thinking I'm a, I'm a drunk, just because I've been drunk for three years now. Uh, but uh, where this question started, now... I'm sitting down there in Montana State Prison going, what the hell now? No matter what happens, whenever I get out, I, I can't have a bar anymore. Yeah. I can't go back to law school. Can't be a teacher. Can't be an accountant. Can't go back in the military. Mm-hmm. Can't be a police officer. What the hell am I going to do? And a little light went on my head. I went, uh... I'll bet nobody ever asks an actor if he has a felony conviction. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I send him what they call a kite uh, to the warden asking for a copy of Hamlet. And I have, I have that. I, I saw it just yesterday in my room with the stamp in the front. Assistant Bl- uh, Warden Blodgett gives inmate Evans permission to have in his cell Hamlet. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah. that's how I became an actor. Oh, man. Yeah, I, that is crazy. I used to be a bouncer in a bar, and I got into a couple fights, and my boss was a millionaire, and he got me off the hook uh, before anything even went to trial. I was very lucky. Yeah. But, you know, and this was, you know, the, the, this was 12 years ago. Happened. Yeah. 12 years ago? Yeah, this was 12 years ago. <laughs> I, I was very, very lucky, but wow. So did you did you move to New York? No. When I got out, I'm mm-hmm. still on parole. Yeah. I went to uh, uh, Montana State University in Bozeman, which uh, they don't have a theater department anymore, but they did at the time. And I started doing theater, and then I went through that... Uh, uh, a lot of young actors reach this realization. I went through a period where, uh, after about three months, where I realized that uh, I was really lucky I became an actor because I was probably the greatest living actor in the English-speaking world. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, that moment. God damn, I'm good. You know? yeah. And uh, so I was, and I did have the advantage by that time I was... Uh, like 26 or something, everybody else in the theater department was 19. Mm -hmm. And I'd uh, been to war and been to prison, and so I had a little more grit than most of the other people in the theater department. I got a lot of good casting. And then that spring, I went to Berkeley to see an old girlfriend. And there, uh, there was a guy uh, named Donovan Marley, who was doing auditions for a theater that was in Santa Maria, California, called Pacific Conservatory of Performing Arts. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it was just no. an oasis of great theater. Uh, many of the same actors that worked at ACT in San Francisco would, would spend their summers down at PCPA. And I'll, and I went in. Now I was part of what I re, uh, referred to a, a moment ago. My arrogance as a young actor. I didn't have any intention of. You know, I was at Montana State University. I wasn't going to go to a junior college for their summer theater. But I thought I could go in and and practice my audition pieces. So I went in and I did uh, did my two my two pieces, and. Uh, 
he had a piano an accompanist with him and he said uh, great what, what's your song and I said oh I don't sing mm-hmm. and <laughs> he's a nice guy you know he said oh he said, it doesn't have to be a prepared song he said just a little happy birthday or something just so I can get an idea of your timber and your range and, and being an ex-convict <laughs> I said <laughs> Maybe he didn't hear me, pal. Yeah. He said, I don't sing. And I look over, and the accompanist is about to run out of the room. He's looking at me like it's Hannibal Lecter over there, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and I, so I just left. I didn't think any more about it. And uh, a few weeks later, I got a job offer. And so I happened to know one guy who was teaching down, a guy from Montana who was teaching in Salinas, Mm -hmm. teaching in the theater department, Salinas. And I called him and said, "Uh, do you know anything about this guy, Donovan Marley? He said, if Donovan Marley um, offered you a job, you have to take it. You have to take it. And to give you an idea how absolutely true that was, uh, I don't know, do, do you know that I'm on this show called Bosch now? Yeah. You familiar with that? That's on That's on Amazon? Yeah. And it's one of the best jobs I've ever had in my life. It's just wonderful. And the executive producer and creator of the show, along with Michael Connolly, who created the character Bosch, uh, is a guy named Eric Overmeyer, who I met at PCPA in 1976. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> how's that for a payoff? Wow, that is a, a crazy journey. <laughs> yeah. Wow, and I've I've heard a lot of crazy journeys, but wow. Did did any of your um, classmates uh, go on to become successful? Oh yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, particularly uh, in the uh, the uh, theater world, the, the Broadway's filled with the actors, you know, all, all the, you know, I, I've got 25, 30 friends who spent the last 40 years just working on Broadway shows. Robin Williams was a PCPA actor. Mm. Uh, Harry Hamlin was a PCPA actor. Uh, um, Powers Booth, uh, do you know Powers was? Oh, yeah. I hear about years ago, but Powers Booth was a PCPA actor. And, uh, uh, and more. I mean, it's just, there's just bazillions of them. It was just, uh, and, the, and the, the quality of the theater was so good, and and his taste in actors were so good that those people you were working with were people who were going out and working in movies and films and working in other theaters, and then that gives you a little, at least you could meet somebody and maybe get a chance, maybe get an audition, and you know, like uh, any other business, you have to know somebody to, you know, eventually you have to deliver the goods. But mm-hmm. if you never meet anybody, you get you have zero chance of doing that, you know? Yeah. Uh, oh. what, what year did you move to L.A.? Well, let's see, that was 76, and I spent... Two or three years. By 1980, I was in L.A. Mm-hmm. And then, and then, uh, and maybe a little earlier than that. But I know my first TV job, very first day on a TV show, was uh, a Billy Crystal show, Soap. Yeah. Uh, that was that was 1980. I was the bailiff, and I I said, "All rise." For $350. I thought, no, $225. I thought, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I'm getting $100 a word, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all clover. Uh, and then then I, uh, in those days, I used to uh, go out of town quite a bit and do theater. Uh, and then whenever I didn't have a theater job, I'd come back and, and bang on doors in L.A. Uh, mm mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah. So I'm going to mention movies and TV shows you were in. Tell me anything you remember. 
Lou Grant. Oh. Well, I'll tell you one thing I remember about Lou Grant. Mm -hmm. uh, but first of all, that was real early in my career, too. Yeah. And, and it was a really good job and a prestigious job. That was a, a high, high caliber show. But we were shooting in North Hollywood. And uh, we were shooting inside a little convenience store where I got murdered on that show. I was just a guy that went in shopping and there was a guy robbing the, the store and he kills me. Uh, and then that's what the episode was about, was about that guy's murder case. Uh, uh, but I'm sitting in the cast chair out on the sidewalk outside the store while the crew is setting up inside. And an uh, um, elderly woman with one of those uh, per a personal shopping cart, you know, a little wire cart with wheels on the back, was on her way to the store. And... Uh, uh, she looked over at me and she said, making a movie? I said, well, yeah, yeah. And she goes on, goes to the store, and about three minutes later, she came back the other, she'd done her shopping, she had her groceries and her thing, and she looked over at me and she said, uh, still making the same movie? I said, well, yeah. She said, no wonder it costs so much. <laughs> <laughs> We spent almost a whole hour working on this movie, and we weren't done. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what I remember about Lou Grant. Yeah, I just interviewed Ed Asner a couple of weeks ago. Oh, my God. Yeah, the biggest one I've ever gotten. And I'll tell you, interviewing journeymen such as yourself is, is a lot more exciting and fun because the big stars they don't they don't open up to you unless you're Larry King or Barbara Walters I've found and and was was he like that was he a little tight yeah I mean he was nice but it just he didn't really give me much that he hasn't said before you know yeah so it wasn't it, 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 it was an honor to talk to him but it wasn't that great like you would imagine um Hill Street Blues. Oh. You did a couple of those. Uh, first of all, now here's a funny thing. I'm sure you're familiar with the term typecasting. Yes. And, you know, I mean, that's, you know, like, uh, pretty much in my career, I played, uh, uh, ops. You know, I played cops and cops and cops and cops. Mm -hmm. and, and sheriffs. And then the occasional bartender or cab driver or something like that, but mostly cops. Yeah. On Hill Street Blues, I did, uh, I, I worked it twice. And uh, uh, about two years apart. And <laughs> both times... Mm -hmm. I played a crooked health inspector. Yeah. Now that now that's pretty niche typecasting, you know. We've got a oh yeah, crooked health inspector. Didn't we have a guy who played a crooked health inspector two years ago? Yeah. <laughs> Let's get him again. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny, but uh, yeah, that was. Uh, 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 th that was that was really really a, a fantastic job. Uh, I had a uh, a little. I actually made quite a bit more money than I was supposed to make because the, one of my scenes was with Kyle Martin. Yeah. And uh, he couldn't find him. He was drunk in Mexico for like ten days. And they had to carry me all that time and pay me over to which at the time I didn't want the money because I was supposed to be starting a play back up in Santa Maria. Mm -hmm. And and I couldn't start it in Santa Maria. That's one thing. They were not sympathetic to conflicts with film. They believed the theater was more important than some fucking TV show. Yeah. So they were not happy about the fact that I wasn't up there, but I was under contract to him. And um, 
And then I also remember, um, oh, let me look, um, what's his name? Um, one of the other actors, I know him too, but I can't think of his name now because I'm... Uh, on Hill Street Blues? Yes. Uh, Daniel J. Trevanti? No, not not Daniel. Just a second. Now I've got IMDB up so I can look him up. Uh, uh, Joe Spano, who oh. I actually knew because I'd worked at the Berkeley Rep. I knew Joe Spano from the Berkeley Rep. And... Uh, he's such a nice man. He's a really good actor. And I wasn't involved in the scene, but I was downtown L.A. They are doing this other scene first. And Joe Spano was undercover as a bag lady. And the reason was uh, somebody was assaulting and killing these homeless bag ladies on the street. Yeah. <laughs> so he was... So he was dressed up like an old lady and hanging on the street and this guy attacked him and almost killed him in the, you know, in the storyline. Mm -hmm. And I can remember it was so, vi the scene was so vivid that I could barely keep myself from run you know, running into the scene and, 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 uh, and taking on this guy because I just, I just couldn't stand watching this guy just kick the shit out of Joe Spano. Uh, mm -hmm. But it, it worked out. <laughs> so, you know, there's a, a famous story about Daniel J. Trevanti mm -hmm. and uh, uh, oh, what's the uh, uh, the creator's name? Uh, Stephen Botchko. Uh, Botchko. Yeah. So uh, in the first season, uh, they were doing a scene, and that was a scene where the, that was a show where the writers were gone. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a line, and Travanti, and the show had blown up. Travanti had gone from being a, another actor to being a big star. And he had this uh, line, and he just didn't want to, he just didn't want to say it. And, uh, uh, you know, the direct, and the director didn't have the power to change it. And so they're on location, they have to stop and they wait. And it takes an, about an hour for Bochco to get down there. And Bochco comes over and he says to Trevante, he says, uh, Danny, uh, uh, what's the problem? And uh, he said, well, he said, uh, it, it's just this line. He said, uh, you know, Ferrillo just, uh, just wouldn't say it. Yeah. So, well, let me look at it. I mean, he took the script, and he looks. He said, oh, yeah. Yeah, sure he would. Look. It says Perillo right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that's drawing a line in the sand, isn't it? Yeah, it is. <laughs> oh, man. Rhinestone. Yeah. Oh my God, she's an angel. Yeah, I've heard. She, and of course, uh, uh, Stallone, uh, not so much. Yeah. <laughs> we there were many, many not just uh, hours. There were days that Stallone would not come out of his trailer. Uh, and when that would happen. Then uh, Dolly Parton, you know, because there were like 200 of us. We did all those saloon scenes and stuff. Mm -hmm. And Dolly Parton would get up on stage and play and sing for us. Until Stallone finally deigned to come out of his, his luxury accommodation. And I'll, I'll tell you, this is, I, I just love this story so much. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of the coolest things I've ever witnessed in my life, and and it, and it goes also it goes it's, goes a little bit to how weird Hollywood can be. Yeah. Um, uh, we're on the on the the set of Rhinestone, and three guys 
who were on the Fox lot for some reason. I have no idea what these guys were doing together or why they were on the Fox lot. But they decide to come see Sly. And the three guys are Jim Neighbors. <laughs> you know who Jim Neighbors is? Yes. Goma Pyle, right? Yes. Tommy Lasorda. <laughs> and Ray Boom Boom Mancini. Do you know who Ray Boom Boom Mancini is? Yep, I know them all. Middleweight champion of the former middleweight champion of the world. Yeah. The guy who actually oh, had the misfortune of killing another guy in the ring. You yeah. know, I mean, he, this is a tough guy. And they come to see Sly, and Sly didn't want to see them. So he wouldn't come out of his trailer. And they're hanging out, and he's hiding in his trailer. And the producers are, because, it, you know, it, it's uh, $100,000 a minute to have, have that, that set, you know. Mm. And it's, it's just the clock is running, and nothing is happening. Those guys are hanging, the stones aren't coming out. So they grab this young security guard mm -hmm. and said, go over and tell those guys they have to leave. I thought, well, I want to see this. So I drift over that way. This guy walks over to him. He says, Mr. Mancini? He says, yes. He said, Mr. Mancini, you, sir, are a great, great fighter. He shook his hand. And so he said, thanks. And the guy walked back to the producers. And the producers said, what did they say? The security guard said, they said they'd leave in a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and that's what I thought. That security guard should be the producer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. They said they'd leave in a few minutes. <clears throat> and and I'll tell I'll tell you another another Dolly Parton story. Jury, while we were shooting that movie, mm -hmm. uh, there was a terrible storm. Worst storm I've ever seen in L.A. I mean, horizontal rain flooding all over the west side, Santa Monica, flooded. hundreds and hundreds of trees down, traffic stopped. It was really a, a, essentially a hurricane. And only about half the cast and crew even made it in. And I'm in there on the set, and one of those, those heavy, those big heavy industrial doors they have on the set cracks open and the wind catches it and catches that door open and throws Dolly Parton, who is about or eight or something, you know, slopes her into the, into the room. She comes flying into the room, soaking wet, and the, uh, Bob Clark, who was the director, ran over. He said, Dolly, Dolly. He said, uh, yeah, I'm so glad to see you. Are you all right? She said, yes, I'm all right. She said, but isn't this terrible? She said, I was out there, my hair blowing in the wind. <laughs> I was too proud to chase it. <laughs> <laughs> I was too proud to chase him. Yeah, that's oh, yeah. I I can't speak too highly of her. So yeah. that's, that's, that's probably all the rhinestone dirt I have for you. Uh, Teen Wolf. Uh, Teen Wolf. Uh, mainly uh, that 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 was was pleasant. Uh, uh, Michael J. Fox was really a uh, uh, really a star mm -hmm. at, at that time, you know. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, and then there was a a, a guy and uh, entered Jay Tarsus. Yeah, he's hilarious. You know Tarsus is. Yes. Jay, Jay Tarsus was played the. He was the real coach. He played uh, uh, Michael Fox's coach. And I was the coach of the other team, you know. Uh, and uh, Jay Tarsus may be the funniest man uh, alive on the face of the earth. And, you know, he was a big-time comedy writer. Yep. Uh, but uh, he... Uh, uh, I, that's where I spent most of my time just watching Jay Tarsus. Here's, a, here's an example of Jay Tarsus. There was a very beautiful woman who was a makeup artist mm -hmm. on the show, and, and second or third day, Jay Tarsus is over uh, chatting her up, and uh, uh, she she said, uh, uh, what, "What 
do you do? Are, are you an actor? Yeah. He said, oh, 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 an actor? Uh, uh, no, no, no. Uh, well, I, uh, on this movie, yes, I'm an actor. But that, in, in real life, no, no. I, uh, um, uh, I, I do uh, other, other things. Yeah. She said, what other things? She said, I'm a chiropractor. <laughs> I used to do a similar I used to say I was a massage therapist <laughs> yeah that's right yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll give you an adjustment uh. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah I've talked to like five other people from Teen Wolf and uh, yeah Jay Tarsus is hilarious you know I love it when um <clears throat> Yeah, you know, yeah, he's trying to forfeit the game, and you're telling him there's a lot to learn from losing. And he says, "Okay, we'll play if it's that big a deal to you." And then he walks away, and then you're just looking like there's something wrong with that guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, I just, I just love, love him to death. Uh, let's see who else is. I, I'm just looking. He's uh, Scott Pollan, who is. Uh, uh, in that movie, he's also a Berkeley rep actor. Great actor, uh, and, yeah. Uh, and Greg Gitson, no, Greg Gitson, Greg Gitson played the president on 24, had a Emmy nomination for that. After Dennis Haysbert? Uh, what? After Dennis Haysbert played the president? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Him and my mom grew up together, uh, by the way. And Haysbert? Yeah. Oh yeah, and what did I work with him on? Oh, what was that movie? Uh, it was it was about the day uh, Kennedy was shot. Oh. Um, um, what the heck was that movie? Uh, in the Line of Fire. Was that no, movie? No. Let's see. Let me let me look it up. Uh, but go ahead while I'm dicking around with my phone. Go ahead and. How about um, Near Dark? Oh, Near Dark. There's a... Ah, uh, that... You know, I... I, I don't... Um, I don't like horror movies. I don't like... You know, like, I can't... I can't watch even... I can't watch war movies. Yeah. Any of the big... Uh, I mean, I, I saw Apocalypse Now. I haven't seen any war movie since then. Uh, and, in fact, on Near Dark, uh, I had a real hard time in the makeup trailer because, you know, they take Polaroids of all the, as they make people up. So they had all that horror, all those horror makeup things, all bloody people all over, all over the walls. Oh, yeah. And I, but then I had that one, that lovely scene, uh, uh, that that I, I I just I just loved that. It was sort of like like a uh, to me like an old time. Uh, well, like that was my Ben Johnson scene. Yeah. You know, just a so just a nice. He's a sheriff, and he's not busting the kids' chops. He's just what's going on. You know, I, I don't know, he's a vampire or whatever the fuck he is, but I end up giving him some money so he can get home instead of arresting him. And uh, it was just, I'll tell you what I I feel badly about is that I never worked with uh, Karen Bigelow again. Cause yeah. I think Catherine Bigelow. Maybe that's why I never worked with her again. Because I can't never remember anybody's name. Mm -hmm. You say that helps. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she's very talented. Um, yeah, Academy Award winner. Yeah. How about planes, trains, and automobiles? Oh. Well, that, that's the best story ever. The absolute best story mm. in, in, uh, I could ever possibly tell you. That's the first movie I ever got. And the part... Uh, wasn't really scripted. Uh, it was just a guy um, uh, who was, uh, uh, picks them up uh, hitchhiking and uh, makes them uh, uh, get, the, get in the uh, trailer instead of in the 
uh, in, instead of in the truck, you know? Yeah. And so <laughs> I go in, and this, see, this wouldn't happen today. They didn't have any lines written for this guy. It's just this scene. And I go in, it's just me and John Hughes mm-hmm. in this room. That's, I mean, today, uh, uh, the guy doing that part might never even see the director when he works. You know, there's just, but the night, and, and everything just for a camera. There's some, some schmuck in there running the camera and yeah. going and say your lines, and then you either get the part or not. But I go in. And he's like, really, and explaining to me what the scene is and stuff. And as he's explaining the scene to me, I remember it's an old plumber's line. You know, plumber, uh, you know what? Uh, uh, plumbers love to say, it might be shit to you, but it's bread and butter to me. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. So so he starts running down. He says, and he says uh, if, you want, if you want to try to add lip something or something, I don't. And so so we we start the little scene. I say, I say, all right, you guys, all right. All right, it's cold out there. I'll let you ride in the back. I said, but you be careful back there. It might be cheese to you, but that's bread and butter to me, pal. <laughs> well, Sean Hughes thought that was freaking hilarious. And he hired me. Mm-hmm. They were paying me $1,000. And uh, what's the date on that movie? Uh, 1987. 87, right? So, and Heather and I had a $300 a month apartment, and I didn't have the rent. And they're paying me $1,000 for the freaking day. And I'm like, holy shit. Holy shit. That's three months' rent, you know, for doing yes. this one day. And then, but I was, I was awfully green. Then they call and say, oh, uh, they decide they're going to shoot that scene in Buffalo, New York. And my thought was, I'm like, how in the fuck am I supposed to get to Buffalo, New York? You know, <laughs> how I get to Buffalo, New York? I've spent my thousand dollars. You know, mm. and my agent actually said, no, they pay for you to go, and you you get a day of travel going out, a day of travel coming back. I said, what's that mean? He says, you get a thousand dollars for those days. I'm like, what? <laughs> oh, I'm making three thousand dollars. So now I'm pretty freaking happy. Then I get to Buffalo, New York, I get in the hotel, and a teamster comes to the hotel, uh, comes to my door, knocks on the door, and gives me $150. I said, hey, 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 hey. So, What's going on here? I'm supposed to be getting $1,000 a day. He said, this is your per diem. I didn't even know what the fuck per diem was. I'd never heard of per diem. Yeah. <laughs> you know? and yeah. He, the teamster the says, it's your fucking spending money. Like, holy shit, I've got $150 spending money and I'm making $3,000? Well, I'm in Buffalo, New York for two weeks and they don't shoot the scene. Uh-huh. And, and I, now I'm, all I'm doing, I'm sitting in my, uh, in my hotel room uh, uh, doing the math over and over and over and over and hoping that they don't figure it out, because if they figure out that I'm there and they're paying me $1,000 a day and I'm not doing anything, they'll probably put me in jail, <laughs> you know? And so then I, I, so then after about two weeks, and they call me down to the production office, yeah, we're, we're moving to Chicago. So I think, oh, fuck, now I don't even get to be in the movie. I said, so what? I go back to L.A. and said, no, no, you go with us. So two weeks in Buffalo, a couple weeks in Chicago, St. Louis, Kankakee, Illinois, uh, Woodstock, Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio, Quail Hollow, Ohio, 11 different cities, 51 fucking days before they get to my scene. Wow. Is it freezing cold? When we start this, I start this movie, we don't have our $300 in rent. And when I finished doing my one freaking line in planes, trains, and automobiles, we bought a house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the, and, and the other thing that's ironic about that, I mean, I've done fine. I mean, I've, if you look at my IMDb, I've worked 
steady now for 40 years, just worked and worked and worked. Right. But that, that 51 grand is the most money I've ever made on a movie. Wow. Uh, all the other movies, I, I generally, you know, I, I generally make like, uh, what's what's sort of standard for character actors, you know, five or six thousand dollars a week, and I get five or six weeks on the show, and that's, uh, uh, you know, which sounds like a ton of money, but if you're only working six weeks that year, you're not exactly, you know, hanging with the Kardashians. But yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, it's uh, I I love the PTA story. Yeah, ironically, made a difference in my life. Yeah, ironically, you had a scene that was cut from the next John Hughes movie, The Great Outdoors, and I remember seeing it on network TV. Yes. You remember that? Uh, that, that was, <laughs> uh, uh, yes, yeah, that was uh, uh, a guy named Howie Deutsch. Yep. Um, uh, and he, uh, uh, he and John Hughes were... Uh, uh, he might even have been John Hughes' cinematographer for a while or something. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I had a, I gave uh, uh, John Candy a ticket. By by the way, I want to tell you, uh, I, I I I forgot this. Yeah, I'm sitting in that hotel uh, in uh, uh, Chicago, and I you know I really was nobody on that, on that movie and I'd never really even been on the set and certainly not met John Candy or any of the and it's the night of the Academy Awards and I'm sitting in my underwear eating room service mm -hmm. and the phone rings I said hello he said, hello is this Troy I said yeah I said uh, Troy this is John Candy uh, I'm having a few people up to my room to watch the Academy Awards and wondered if you'd like to join us and I was like so excited. Oh God, I thought that I'll meet the producers and, you know, again, John Candy is having it. You know, and I, so I, I couldn't dress up. I didn't have any clothes. You know, I'd left home with, with, with one, you know, with a change of underwear. I thought it was going for two nights, you know, mm -hmm. shaving kit and a change of underwear. And uh, so I didn't have anything to dress up with, but I, you know, looked as good as I could and went up to John Candy's room. No producers there, no director there. Uh, uh, no Steve Martin there. You know who's there? Who? All the people like me. Everybody on the movie that wasn't important was who John Candy invited up to his room. Oh, that's so nice. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, he's just... And, you know, this is the first time in my life I had cash. You know, yeah. not about a thousand dollars worth of room service during the, the course of the Academy Awards. So on the, on the way, you know, when it was over, I I stepped over to him and I offered him two hundred in cash to ship in on the on the room service. And I'll always remember this. He said, "Troy, that's been taken care of." Oh, a nice guy. That's been taken. That's been taken care of. Um, it, yeah, he was he was just so so sweet. Uh, wonderful, wonderful guy. Yeah, I, I I think it's so sad that he's gone. It is. It is. He was a rarity of one of the kind. There, there just there just aren't many like him. No. Uh, so uh, uh, great outdoors, and you know, uh, you know who else? Uh, Annette Benning, right? Who's also somebody I knew. I knew her from the theater. Mm -hmm. I knew her from uh, ACT in San Francisco and from the Denver Center Theater Company. And uh, uh, so she was, uh, and I was friends with her. Uh, her, she at that time she was married to a guy named Jay Stephen White, and was uh, uh, friends with him as well. And then uh, went up. I, I spent a few weeks up there. Uh, oh, one of those lakes up outside uh, uh, L.A. where we where we shot that, and, and it was perfectly pleasant. But uh, uh, oh, and I had and you've already seen this. You know, I just the the name part of my brain is just broken. Mm -hmm. So 
So I'm finally I'm shooting the scene with John Candy where I I give him the the ticket, and then they they come around, and uh, the, the director was was uh, Howard Deutsch, and uh, they they're doing my close up, and by that time I knew enough about uh, uh, you know acting for a camera that I knew you need to know where the eye line is, which is where you look so that when they cut it together, it looks like I'm looking at John Candy, you know, yeah. uh, even though the camera's right there in my face. And I, I lean around to the cinematographer and I said, <laughs> said uh, uh, what's my eye line? And he looked around, there's like 30 people back there behind the camera. He says, uh, just look at Howie. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's how we do it. And you watch, <laughs> watch, you watch the faces. There's like 29 faces that, that they're just dropped. Like, oh man, we've seen dumb fucking actors, you know, but this guy, <laughs> this guy takes the cake and there's one guy just laughing his ass off. Yeah. And that was Howie Deutsch. He thought that was hilarious. And then he he hired me for the best movie part I've ever had. That uh, uh, a big part in a film called Article Ninety Nine. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know that film. But yeah, I, uh, I, Keith I know it. Sutherland, Ray Liotta, Forrest Whitaker, Eli Wallach, Kathy Baker. Uh, you know that that film was just loaded. Mm -hmm. And we thought we were going to the Academy Awards with that movie, and it opened on the same day as Wayne's World. <laughs> and, uh, and it was at Orion, Orion. Yeah. And they were bankrupt. They didn't have any money to promote it, so nobody knew about it. And Wayne's World did $400 million and we did like a million. Wow. <laughs> How about Halloween 5? I'm sure you get recognized from that movie a lot amongst horror fans. I do. They're they're fanatical. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and it's always hard for me to explain to them that I I have never seen a Halloween movie. I don't. Have any, I mean, I appreciate that they uh, are appreciative, but I don't know what they're talking about because I've never seen it. And I'm not gonna see it. Yeah. <laughs> 
yeah, they're not for everybody. I personally love them, but they're not for everybody. How about uh, one of my earliest memories of you was in My Blue Heaven. Yes. Uh, <laughs> a, another another really, really uh, wonderful movie. Uh, a wonderful job. You know, that, that bunch of mooks. Yeah. Um, uh, that, you know, that, that were the the guys that I that I hung around with, um, William Hickey. Who, oh, with Bill Hickey. He just here's the first time I ever saw Bill Hickey. Yeah. He picked us up at the airport, and they 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 they, they took me to the and what it was is up by San Luis Obispo, in a, uh, uh, you know this uh, development one of those uh, like. Uh, you know, a developed neighborhood with all those kind of twisty roads around and, mm-hmm. and uh, upper middle class houses and, and all that. And one of those was the, the model home. And that was the production office. And there's uh, two middle-aged ladies trying to go in there. And there was an AD out there, same thing, you know, some 19-year-old kid tell them they couldn't go in because it isn't really, it isn't the model home today. Today, it's being used as a production office by a movie. Well, we won't bother anybody. We just want to look around. And they they would not take no for an answer. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, Bill Hickey stepped over and said, Hey, keep walking. Tell your head float. (laughs) That guy was great. (laughs) That guy was so yeah. great. Yeah, I remember. I'm in the parking in the parking lot outside the motel, and he's uh, um, they have lawn and stuff out there, but he's walking his dog around out on the on the asphalt, all walking around on the asphalt. And uh, uh, I said something about uh, don't you want to walk your dog on the grass or something? He said, "We're from Brooklyn." Where my dog shits, nothing grows. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. I remember you open that dinner roll and you're disappointed. There's nothing in it, and then the other guys are talking about what they hate about San Diego, and you like throw the roll on the table. You're like, everybody's so nice. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I love the. Uh, it's a popover. Yeah. There's nothing in there. Yeah. I heard Steve Martin's very John serious. Each in that group? Yeah. John each in there? I think so. Let's see. I'm, I'm looking. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure he was. You know, John John Capadice is a if you if you know that that actor, he he I'd seen him once a, a few years ago. He just bought a house, and he was real happy. And I saw him again. And asked him about his house. He said he got rid of it. Yeah. Uh, he said, I, I, I couldn't stand it. I said, I said well, what, what, what was wrong with it? He said, when you own a house, there's no super. <laughs> 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 when your water heater is, is, is busted, you have to deal with it yourself. Nobody told him that before he bought a house. Up in the Queens, you know, you call the super. Do you have a good story about Charlie and oh, well, oh, I was gonna say, do you have a good story about Charlie and Emilio on Men at Work? Oh no, I can barely even remember it. Okay. This, I, 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 I do know uh, that I, I've, uh, I've never seen Ch- uh, Charlie since then, but I've, I've run into Emilio a few times over the years. Yeah. And. Um, and you know, I mean, I worked on that show one day. Yeah. And you know, one scene, one day. And uh, Emilio is one of those guys. Uh, when he sees me, he knows me by name, and he talks to me as if we've been friends for decades. He's a super nice guy, and mm-hmm. and, uh, and spectacular people skills. Wow, that's good. That's good. How about the the stand? Oh, well, the stand is 
another one. You know, so many of the jobs I've done are just, you know, the stand, I uh, basically, I flew up to Salt Lake City, and then the next day I uh, put this guy in a jail cell, and then I was dead. Uh, Although, I'll tell you something, something interesting happened Mm -hmm. uh, from the stand. Just a second. Mm -hmm. Um, What's the director's name? Mick Garris. Uh, Mick Garris. Mick Garris, yes. So, he... uh, called me a few years after that and he was doing uh, he was doing a video for Michael Jackson yes and asked if I would uh, work on the video and the video was a takeoff on those old uh, former movies from the 40s and and they were using that that uh, uh, ragtag mansion uh, from the Adams family on the uh, it's on the Universal lot and uh, and Michael Jackson lived in that and the townspeople come with their torches to tell him to get out of town because he's too weird and we're all yelling get out of town we hate you here and and Michael Jackson comes out and says, why do you hate me? <laughs> You're too weird. You know? And yeah. then he picks up this, like, three-year-old boy and says, he doesn't think I'm weird. <laughs> <He's> <laughs> like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. And then and we, we were, uh, it was, uh, the rules were so strict working on it. We couldn't have our phones with us. We couldn't. Uh, we couldn't leave the set. We had to come in in the morning and stay there all day and then leave. And when we left that night, mm-hmm. those charges had come out against him in in uh, uh, Santa Barbara. And uh, then we never went back. They never finished it. Uh, That's something. But that, that, was a, that was a pretty pretty freaky day. And when we did the close work, Mick had me play the the crowd uh, 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 across the camera from Michael Jackson, and then Michael Jackson would give me notes, but he wouldn't speak to me directly. He'd speak to a whisper to a guy, would whisper to a guy, would whisper, and would go around the room, and that guy would come over to me, says, "When you do it, then give me, uh, you know, notes," and then we do it again. And it would go. It's one of the strangest days of my life. Yeah. Yeah, and of course I gotta bring up Ace Ventura, Pet Detective. Oh, uh, what a that was a great job. That was a great, great job. And of course he's uh, you know he's just, he's a genius. Yeah. And uh, uh, it was. Um, uh, it was really fun. We were, you know, shooting in Miami, and it was real loose. It was actually, you know, lots of times when you're doing comedy, it doesn't seem funny when you're doing it. Yeah. And, and sometimes it is, and sometimes it isn't. But in that case, uh, we had a really good time. And Courtney Cox was really nice, and uh, 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 Noble Willingham. He's, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Noble also worked on that, uh, on that movie, uh, uh, Article 99. And mm-hmm. then, you know, it's kind of weird when you work on a movie and you're working with Dan Marino and, yeah. uh, uh, Courtney Cox, Sean Young, uh, Tone Loke. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that was just, and, and that movie, um, more than anything else I've ever done has paid off in in residual payments, you know, and once the producers have made their money back, uh, then 2% of everything that comes in after that point goes into a pot that's split up amongst the actors, prorated 
uh, based on how much they made on the movie. So if you made, if one guy made $100, another guy made $1,000, the guy who made 1000 gets 10 times as much in residuals, you know. But for those of us who are still, you know, near, near the bottom, as I was, and, you know, I mean, to this day still, every year, uh, I, I get a, a decent, you know, that's, you know, that's 25 years ago. Mm. And I still get, uh, you know, a few hundred dollars in residuals from Ace Ventura Pet Detective every year, which is not a fortune, but, uh, you know, when you add those numbers together. Yeah, I mean, I've never seen a guy just blow up so quick after years of paying dues. I mean, it was just insane. I mean, it was Jim Carrey mania in the mid-90s, and and it lasted a long time. Oh, yeah, he, you know, he, uh, uh, on the set, he kept he kept saying, this movie's going to do $200 million. And I'd done, a, as you know, a whole bunch of these moderate-budget films that would, you know, I mean, they'd be respectable, but they'd make $20 million, $30 million, something like that, you know? Mm-hmm. And I'm just thinking, what's this guy smoking? Well, I'll bet it's done a billion dollars in the past 25 years. I'll bet it's... And, you know, Tom Shadyak, who directed it, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, he uh, uh, had some sort of an epiphany here 10 or 15 years ago and he essentially quit the movie business and he mm. gave all his money to charity and he lives in a trailer up on Pacific Coast Highway. Mm. And, uh, wow, that's a pretty interesting guy. Yeah. So is Bosch um, still in production? Uh, I go back to work next Thursday. Nice. I had nice. a, I had a, uh, Zoom meeting this morning on COVID safety, mm-hmm. and uh, I and I I've, I've had two COVID tests, and I get another one on Monday, and then Thursday we go to work. Oh, that's so, great, Troy. Yeah. Did you? Did, yeah. Did, all, did you lose a lot of financial man, security uh, during COVID? Well, no. You know, the the funny thing is, I was fully retired. When uh, uh, when Bosch came up, mm-hmm. uh, I I uh, uh, did nine years on ER, right, and uh, uh, did the last nine years, and it ended in two thousand nine, and it's a, a you know there's there's no way to you know put a logical spin on what goes on in uh, in show business and in actors' lives. And I, to, uh, to this day, I don't understand exactly why this went this way. But what happened is, on, you know, on ER, I wasn't a series regular, and I never did all the episodes. Yeah. But in an average year, I do maybe 15. I did 135 over a nine-year period, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, so th- but when I was doing ER... I do three or four other jobs every year in addition, mm-hmm. and so I had you know pretty pretty comfortable standard of living. And then when ER ended in two thousand nine, all those other jobs ended too. Yeah, and which I didn't I didn't mind. I mean, I would have preferred to. Just, you know, I was thinking I'm going to have to you know cut way back because I'm not going to have as much. Yeah, I'm going to have just the income from those other jobs yeah. and not the income from ER. And then that wasn't there either. Uh, and I, you know, I figured I've had more than my share. If it's if it's some other actor's turn, so be it, you know. Mm-hmm. And so I just retired, and I've got a, a pretty decent Screen Actors Guild retirement, and I've got uh, Social Security, and that's, you know, and... Uh, and then, here uh, six, seven years ago, Eric Overmeyer called and said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm developing a thing with Michael Connolly, and there might be something in there for you. So we did the pilot uh, where uh, uh, Greg Cummins and I played Craig Barrel, 
Yeah. And you know, if you're on a if you're on a show called Bosch, either you're Bosch or you're not Bosch. Yeah. You know, but I, I sort of like those characters, and I thought, you know, we might get two or three more of these. You know, they might they might write us in a few times. I had no idea that that I was would be six years later. I've you know I've done fifty. 50 or 55, somewhere, you know. Mm-hmm. I've got a bunch of Boshes now, and uh, uh, it's been a real uh, treat. So the, the COVID thing, really, we'd already done the last season was finished, and now this season is late starting, but it's, uh, and this year, we're only doing eight. We're not doing 10, and then Bosch is done. So I think, you know, at the end of, of this year, I'll actually be honestly retired, I believe. But uh, maybe there's a, maybe there might be another surprise waiting for me down the road. Who knows? Yeah, who knows? But I'm glad you're returning to work uh, next week in the, the midst of all this insanity, Troy. And I thank you for coming on today and uh, sharing these great stories. Oh, oh I... As you can tell, I kind of like telling stories. Yeah. <laughs> uh, by the way, I just, uh, I, I should, since you asked about it, I, I should tell you, I had the COVID. Oh, you did? I, I had it in May. Yeah. And, uh, whew, you, you talk about feeling like a lottery winner to be a 72-year-old fat guy <laughs> who's, in, you know, I'm not in terrible shape, but I'm not in the greatest physical shape mm-hmm. and to get this freaking thing and not have it kill me that's pretty that's pretty lucky yeah wow it, but, but you're feeling uh, okay though now oh yeah yeah I basically you know uh, was sick as a dog for two weeks and then it, I, I just uh uh, then, then started feeling better, and just gradually over a period of weeks, just got back to. Now I feel, uh, you know, pretty close to normal. But, and and there's something that's pretty comforting about, you know, you know, I've, I've got, I, I'm, uh, I, I definitely don't have it now. They, I mean, they they test me constantly, the Bosch people. Yeah, you, know, you can't go near that set without getting a test. Uh, and. Um, uh, you know, to know that I have it, it's, that I don't have it, it's it's just a great feeling that I don't have to, I really don't have to sweat it, because mm-hmm. I'm very unlikely to get it again, so. Yeah, well, I'm glad uh, you're feeling better, Troy, and stay safe because we need you, and thanks again, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Hey, now, uh, you know what, I don't know. Uh-huh. So, uh, if I want to, if I want to listen to this, uh, how would I do that? It's on YouTube, and um, I'll send it to you. Okay, fantastic. Uh, I thank you so much. Uh, you're a real pleasure. I, I, uh, I hope you have a beautiful day. Oh, thank you so much, Troy. You too. Okay. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. Well, there you have it, Troy Evans. Ain't he a cool dude? Man, that is crazy to go from almost in prison the rest of your life to acting. That is a great story, a great story, and a great happy ending that is going to keep going. Um, If you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac Comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes!